Hey, I'm here in small town upstate New York. I'm in the village of Trumansburg over there. Liquor store? No. This is the Masonic Temple, that's right. The liquor store is over there, behind me, and over there. We've got the, the village offices. Small village. Not a lot going on. There's the hazelnut kitchen. Little Venice. Little Venice restaurant, look. And so, yeah, it's a... A little town without much going on is definitely not the kind of place that uh, you would go to find a company that was in the process of revolutionizing all of music now, is it? Um, oh, hey, historical marker. Let's see what it says. So this is it. This is where it all began. This building here is where Moog Music designed and built the Moog Modular Synthesizers and the Mini Moog instruments that were used by the likes of Keith Emerson and Wendy Carlos and all that. More than 50 years ago and I'm here because I'm on the way to Ithaca to Cornell University where they are unveiling the Robert Moog archive. And we're going to see if we can get a look at that and see if maybe you can see what else is going on on this Saturday in March. So this is Ithaca. We have geography and we're not afraid to use it. Here we are at the first event of the day, a uh, synth building workshop led by Trevor Pinch and Jordan Macedo. You might know Pinch as a co-author of the book Analog Days, The Invention Impact of the Moog Synthesizer. Uh, the synth in question for this workshop is a very simple circuit. It's a Schmidt trigger square wave oscillator controlled with a pot and a photoresistor and built on a solderless breadboard. And if you're a, a teacher who wants to do this with a class or just an interested individual, you can get the instructions and the bill of materials uh, from a website I'll share in the uh, text below. And uh, here is Pinch's own home-built synth. He built this around 1971, and uh, with a few of the boards replaced more recently, it's still functioning. I'd just like to demo here, this is the first synth I built back in 1973 in London. I, it somehow survived all these years. I played in a band. People don't come to listen to me. They come to look at this. And you're quite welcome to have a look at it afterwards or during the project. And it does make sound. <laughs> There's uh, a YouTube video about this synthesizer, and I'll give you a link to that, too. Uh, it wasn't there just for show. People were encouraged to come up and play it. 
And this event, like the others of the day, was free and open to the public, and the public showed up. Uh, they appeared to be expecting about a third to a half as many people as actually came. Uh, there were a lot of kids, and it was great to see so many people turning out to learn how to build their own noise-making circuit. And after half an hour or so, Pinch's synth isn't the only one making noise. Sitting in back and watching is Jim Scott, and he was one of the three Moog engineers who developed the Mini Moog. Next, we're off to the uh, Carl A. Crotch Library. Kind of loud here. Here's the library. Doesn't look very inviting, but sign says they're open. Let's head in. Here we are at the Hirschland Exhibition Gallery on Level 2B where they have a new exhibit called Electrifying Music, The Life and Legacy of Robert Moog. Let's see what objects and artifacts from the Moog archive they have on display. Well, obviously a Moog modular cabinet. This is from a modular built for Mother Mallard's Portable Masterpiece Company, the world's first live synthesizer ensemble. Going back earlier in time, 1961 catalog of theremin kits and components. This was from just after the company moved from Ithaca to Trumansburg. Here's the company headquarters, maybe you recognize it. Also, from the days before the synthesizer business took off, a guitar amplifier made by Moog and sold under the Segova brand name. But by 1967, it was all about synthesizers. This is a letter from Wendy Carlos to Bob Moog about a module being returned for repair and oscillators whose tuning seemed to be getting worse and some ideas for a touch sensitive keyboard. Here's a shipping log from 1969. Evidently they sent some synth components to some band called the Beatles. A few years later here's a couple of letters written between Frank Zappa and Bob Moog. There's a lot more here. The exhibit's going to be open through mid-October 2020, so if you have a chance to get to Ithaca anytime soon, it's definitely worth seeing. How often do you get to see a Polymoog? Do not touch. Well, 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 you can touch this mini Moog though. It's a reissue, not a vintage one. And there's a couple of theremins, which of course you don't need to touch. Continuing the afternoon, a panel discussion with uh, Steve Dunnington engineer from Moog Music, Ileana Grams Moog, uh, Bob Moog's widow, Mike Adams, president of Moog Music, and Herb Deutsch, whose conversations and collaborations with Bob Moog led to the development of the Moog synthesizer. A semester off to go to the New York State School Music Association's annual convention. And uh, I did, and it was up in Rochester, New York, and I walked into a little room, and there was one man standing there, and a bunch of theremins, and a few tubas. <laughs> First of all, I, I, a few of you smiled about it, and I think I may have laughed pretty loud when I walked in and saw a room with theremins and tubas. And uh, I remember he looks at me and he said, he said, I might have to be proud. He said, I've never been able to, I've never worked for a successful company, one that could take care of the employees and their families. And that really, to this day, really struck me that he knew that, um, you know, six months later, he was fighting his life, basically, basically. But at that point in time, he knew that we were going to carry forward and, and uh, the company was going to be successful in, in a way that would make him proud. Yeah. Following that was an interview with musician Susie Analog. I missed most of that in favor of finding some food. 
finally, a lecture and concert by the legendary synth performer Suzanne Shiani, playing her improvisation on four sequences. Uh, if you're pleasantly surprised a woman known for working with Don Buchla and for playing a Buchla synthesizer was closing out this day of Moog, I was too, but this isn't the old days when Moog and Buchla devotees were r regarding each other as the enemy. And in fact, one of the three iPads she's using for this performance is running the Animoog soft synth. day of Bob Moog and synthesizers and music and it was just a wonderful thing to spend a day doing. I, I didn't even know this was happening up until about three days ago and I found out about it and I said how can I not be there? I live about well less than a, about a little over an hour away, hour and a half. Um, how could I not be here? I had to be in. I just, I just had a great day and I hope you enjoyed getting a glimpse of it and uh, hope you'll continue to tune in on analog output I'm afraid you're probably not going to see another event like this on my channel but you never know what you might see and who knows maybe some ideas that came up today will translate into something you'll see later so you know the like subscribe yeah, that stuff uh, do that and tune in later see you then bye